Hi, this is Gabe Torres, the director of the film The Windigo, and you are listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to the Graveyard. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Well, it's been a while since the graveyard's been open. Well, happy 2024, everybody, here in mid-March. Uh, first podcast of the new year, or should I say, uh, well, we're quarter of the way through the year already, uh, just about. And, uh, well, it's, it's um, history repeating itself. I did the same thing last year. Um, and I am very happy to say that my guest for the show is, well, the man you heard at the top of the show, Mr. Gabe Torres is going to be here. He is the director of the new film, The Windigo, which is currently available on VOD on Amazon, Apple TV and Vudu. And it's also coming here to Los Angeles to the Cine Lounge on March 29th. Uh, sounds like it's a one night only. So if you live in L.A. and you want to check out The Windigo, uh, it will be available in the Cine Lounge on March 29th. Gabe's going to be here in just a little bit. We're going to talk about not only what the movie's about, but um, uh, shooting the film. And uh, they shot, I'll just put it to you this way, they shot in Michigan in the winter. That's all you need to know. All right. So Gabe will be here in just a moment. And uh, he's a longtime friend. Uh, certainly not the first friend I've had on the podcast to help promote one of their projects. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed with this movie. And uh, uh, Gabe's just an excellent filmmaker. And uh, you're going to really enjoy this interview coming up in just a moment. But very quickly, let's talk Oscars, shall we? Um, you know, it was interesting because a year ago uh, I was talking on the podcast about uh, the horror community's disappointment with the fact that not only was Mia Goth not nominated for a Best Actress Oscar for her role in the movie Pearl. Uh, but a lot of people, uh, yours truly included, felt that she should have won the Academy Award for Best Actress for playing Pearl in, uh, in that film. Well, this year we kind of got uh, some uh, awesome payback with Godzilla minus one winning best visual effects. And it was amazing. I mean, like John Carpenter said on X, um, you know, a Godzilla film has won an Academy Award in his lifetime. And it's so true because those of us that have grown up with Godzilla on television, especially, you know, Godzilla's kind of gone through this really interesting evolution from the 1954 original to, to today. Um, a lot of the movies back when I was a kid was the friendly neighborhood Godzilla who hung out with kids and it was just, well, he wasn't hanging out with kids, but it was more kids related uh, films and kind of silly, uh, like tag team wrestling sometimes with some of the kaiju. It was, it was just kind of those weird sort of moments that you can find on YouTube and other um, websites that people have posted, uh, but they were still fun. And there's, hey, look, Godzilla's Godzilla, you know? Um, but, you know, the last two movies that Toho has done with uh, Godzilla, uh, obviously Godzilla Minus One, and then the previous one, which was Shin Godzilla, which was a standalone, they have just been incredible. Um, I liken Godzilla to the band Iron Maiden. They get better with age. Um, I, I, and I say that because I watch Iron Maiden running around the stage at 70 years old. I'm like, I, I, my God, they look and sound the best they probably have ever sounded. Um, and Godzilla is the same way. Actually, Godzilla was turning 75 pretty soon. So uh, these movies um, are just fantastic. And I thought Shin, when I saw that, was probably the second best in the entire series behind the original. After seeing Godzilla Minus One, uh, I think that's probably the best in the entire series. You can make an argument that the original might be the best, and I wouldn't have a problem with that. But man, Godzilla Minus One, here's how good this movie is. Think about it. This movie came out, and those of us that are fans of the film, you know, we saw the trailer, and we were like, oh, can't wait. Man, this looks really good, too. People are starting to pick up on this movie, and you start hearing a buzz, and you start seeing things online, people posting um, positive reviews and how much they're loving it, and then you start getting the repeat viewers, and that's a huge thing, right? 
Um, I was going to go see the movie in December when it came out and my schedule just did not permit it. And I was really kind of upset because I, I thought that when January came around, uh, it was going to be out of the theaters in no time. And I was almost right because early January here in Los Angeles, uh, at least the theater by me, it was uh, down to one showing a day in the afternoon. I was like, okay, well, I could make one of those no problem. And then all of a sudden come early award season by mid-January. Well, it's kind of mid-award season, actually. Um, I'm like, Godzilla minus one's playing like six times a day now. So things started changing and I was like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. And I went on a Tuesday, and I think it was like an 11 o'clock showing. And when I got to the theater, I got there a little early, bought my ticket on on their um, on the computer and, and got it. And it was probably me plus like five people. By the time the movie started, I swear there was probably about 30 people there. Again, Tuesday at like 11 o'clock. So that just goes to show you the word of mouth and... Um, and the popularity that this movie had when you can have like, you know, (laughs) on a random day, uh, you start having a fairly, you know, decent crowd coming to a movie. That says a lot. And um, the movie did not disappoint. And it is fantastic. If you have not seen it yet, I highly recommend it. You don't have to be a Godzilla fan to like this movie or understand this movie. It is a standalone, just like Shin. Um, I highly recommend it, and the visual effects are incredible. Um, they're amazing. The, the movie is just fantastic. And, um, well, that's all I have to say about that. So go see Godzilla Minus One, and um, I am looking forward to seeing Godzilla Minus One Minus Color when they did the black and white uh, edition of the film. Some people have said it's better than the color version. So uh, when it comes out on home video, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'll be buying it. Who am I kidding? Um, and I'm hoping that they come out with both versions on, on, on a multi-disc uh, set. So that would be good. So check out Godzilla Minus One. Congratulations to our friends over at Toho. Uh, job well done. Excellent work. And uh, congratulations. You have more than earned that Academy Award. And I'm very happy to see the Academy uh, reward them with an amazing effort and the fact that it didn't get lost really makes me happy that uh, that they that they chose to vote for Godzilla minus one. All right, on the other side of this interview, I'm going to talk about my fun with YouTube. Ah, uh, yes, fun with YouTube. It is always joyful when YouTube tells you no. I'll get into that in just a little bit. But as you hear in the background, well, a new grave is finally being added here to this here graveyard. And when that happens, that means my guest is here, and it's time for me to get to work. Joining me now is Gabe Torres, who is the director of the new film, The Windigo, which is available on VOD, where you can find it on Amazon, Apple TV, and Vudu. Gabe, it is great to have you joining me here inside the graveyard. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, big fan of the show, and uh, I, your love for horror films is very well known. So glad to be talking Windigo with you today. Well, I can't wait to uh, for you to tell everybody out there what the film is about. Why don't we just get right into it? Why don't you tell everybody out there <laughs> what the film is about? The Windigo is a Native American driven horror film, which has its basis in. Uh, Ojibwe legends about the Wendigo, and it focuses on a, a modern family of Ojibwe who encounter a Wendigo uh, in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, specifically, the the lead is a teenage boy who's struggling with bullying and encounters some meth heads who he then wants to dispatch using the power of the Wendigo. But once he gets that power, he discovers that it is very toxic and can overtake him. And he has to fight to save himself and his family from the Wendigo. Yeah, and I definitely want to talk a little bit about, without giving too much away about the film, uh, but before I get into that, why don't you tell everybody how you uh, ended up getting involved in the project? Yeah, some friends of mine came to me um, sometime back pre-pandemic. So this movie was delayed a little bit in post through the pandemic. Um, came to me back in 2000, late 2018 and said, uh, we're going to do a, a horror film up in Michigan. Uh, we have these elements. We have this farm. We have these woods. We have a lot of 
this kind of stuff. Do you have any scripts that, uh, you know, uh, could fit this? And I said, no, I really don't. But I have a, a friend of mine who's a, a prolific uh, writer and does a lot of horror named Brent Jordan. And uh, I said, I'll ask him what he's got. And I did call Brent and said, you got anything that fits this criteria? He said, no, not really. And so I went back and told him he didn't have anything. And then the next day he said, what do you think about this? And he sent me a, a picture of a Wendigo. And I said, what is that? And he said, that's a Wendigo. I go, you have a script about that? He said, he's like, no, I don't, but I can by next week. <laughs> he's a very fast writer. And so he started writing the script and I pitched it to the producers who had these elements and financing. They go, we love that. Send us the script. I go, well, it's not really written, um, but it will be. And uh, so it kind of got written and tailored to the locations and things. So I literally went on a location scout as the script was being written. I kept sending photos back to Brent and I go, let's let's make the meth lab in this falling down barn. and. You know, write an, an abandoned well and, and write this kind of thing into it. And so we were writing back and forth at night while I was location scouting for the film, which was very different for me because I like to sit with the script for a long time usually. I like to keep reworking it. So we literally wrote the script and went right into pre-production. Wow. Um, which was a little bit challenging. I was going to say, I mean... For those that aren't really familiar with the filmmaking process, when you talk about how challenging that was, can you get into just, you know some bare bones as to like why it would make that challenging? Yeah, it, it, it's challenging because when you're when you write a script that quickly, uh, and then you're right into casting and um, you know manufacturing props and and a creature of this size, you know. You know, the script generally evolves a little bit and you find the nuances of the story and the characters in the readings and the rehearsals and the audition process and the pre-production process, you know, tends to refine the script. And sometimes I can sit on a script for a year and, and come back to it several months apart and, and look at it and go, oh, this, this doesn't work. I need to rework that. And I didn't have that luxury on this. So I had to, to really sort of, you know, speed up that entire development process on the script uh and kept reworking and reworking it night after night after night in the, in the two or three weeks leading up to official prep in in michigan from its its writing time so I, I found that challenging but also you know a lot of fun because i i hadn't worked under that kind of script pressure uh in quite some time so you're an experienced director you've done many different projects many different types of projects um, when you look at Michigan and you see winter <laughs> and night shooting, um, <laughs> what, what starts going through your head? <laughs> well, it was interesting because the producers were, very, were young. And so I was kind of the, the veteran on it. And they were doing their first big movie. And they had all these, you know, as, as you are when you're younger, you, you don't see the difficulties. You only see the, uh, the creative and fun parts of making a movie. And so when they proposed shooting in Michigan in the fall, I said, you know, nights are going to be cold. And then fall, because of the location place we were shooting, pushed into, uh, you know, it, September, October became November. And I said, now we're dealing with winter. And they go, oh, yeah, we'll be fine. We got trailers. We got everything. And, and uh, they learned quickly just how difficult it is to shoot in single digit weather with wind and in a very remote location it's not like you're out on a street and you can just go back inside i mean there were motor homes that were freezing over and stalling and you know condors with lights that would freeze and people were getting you know frostbite and and uh you know had to shut down sometimes because the cold and the wind was just too much and it was it's very physically draining on on a cast and crew to work in those conditions I was going to say, because, I mean, I know you're a fast filmmaker. You know how you can, you know, you know how to take several shots and turn them into one shot or two shots. You're very quick that way. But as mm -hmm. a director, and I think this is something that we don't talk about often when we talk about filmmaking, but as the director of a film like this and you start seeing stuff like that, and you have these elements happening. You have things happening around you with, <clears throat> as you said, the condor and people getting frostbite and all that stuff. How does that kind of stuff affect you as, as a director? It, uh, it weighs heavily on me as a director. And I was also one of the producing team on this, though I, you know, when I 
start directing when I'm producing a movie, I'm all producer until the minute I start directing. And then I let other people worry about the production aspect of it. But part of my brain is still thinking about schedule and budget and stuff and how to, you know, compromise and make choices that won't affect the project creatively. Um, all those things were weighing on me because I know I had a very tenuous, um, crew that was was getting worn out very quickly and we had to really um really focus our nights and make sure that we were taking care of people that there were warming breaks especially the cast and even the you know the, the fellow who played the windigo in the suit you think oh he's got this suit on but it's a very thin very um tight body suit and so he's in single digit degrees and he's also, you know, a creature performer with very little body fat. And so he was getting frostbitten and, and very hypothermic, um, you know, very quickly. And the medics had to continually, you know, put warm fluids in him and, and, you know, really work to keep him, um, warm. And we actually had two PAs whose entire job was between cut and, and action every time i said cut they would run in with two electric blankets and they would hug him wow. <laughs> and so they would literally one from the back and one from the front and they would stay wrapped around him until uh we called action on the next take and that was just like a a process and it was crazy these, these just wrapping him in electric blankets between takes wow you know? wow that and the Wendigo getting some love on set. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> well, I mean, let's talk Everybody about was, yeah. Let's talk about him. Troy, who played uh, Troy James, who does play uh, the Wendigo in the film. Uh, he has a lot of experience doing creature work. Um, did that yes. help you while you were trying to get this film being made and fighting the elements? Yes, because um, you know you can cast anyone to be in a suit like that, um, but it is an incredibly specific skill set. And not only is it movement and performance based, but there is also a certain mindset and a physical durability that you have to go through. Being in one of these suits and being a creature performer is an arduous physical task. I mean, you are in uncomfortable headpieces and limited um, vision and uncomfortable things that are hugging your body. You, you literally can't go to the bathroom for hours sometimes, or, or, you know, it shuts down production for 40 minutes to peel you out of the suit and put you in. So you have to limit your, your water intake. And, and so this person has to perform an incredibly physical task, but also remain, uh, focused and, um, put up with quite a bit of uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortability and Troy, you know, has done creatures, you know, for many years now. And he's, he's one of this, these elite few people who are known in the business to play creatures. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple of, of people who, you know, just specialize in that. And he's one of them. I probably could count on one hand, the people who are most known for that. And, and he's unique in the fact that he's an, an extreme contortionist. So he began his career on America's Got Talent as he was like in working in human resources and his friends encouraged him to go on America's Got Talent because he could bend his body literally like a pretzel, like backwards, forward, anything. And it's it's crazy to watch him, you know, bend his waist, you know, 180 degrees around and face the other direction or, you know, bend a limb backwards behind his head and, or fall apart like a marionette. And, do these things so once he gets into a creature suit he can do all these really incredible like walk backwards on his hands and feet like a spider inhabit a costume in a way that nobody else can so um to bring his skill set to the windigo and and create a character he's very he's very specific and he's very uh, um method in his his approach to these creatures i'm sure too for you as a director uh, knowing that he is so experienced doing this that you there there must be a shorthand where you can go oh do this and he would understand as opposed to someone who doesn't do that and they're trying to figure it out i'm sure he having been in front of the camera doing this a lot that that just aids in getting that that shot quicker it does and we did some rehearsals without the suit so we would do movement rehearsals for you know a day or two ahead and we would get sort of body position and 
you know, arm usage and how the head bit works. And then we had a sort of a fake foam version of the head that he could wear for rehearsals that uh, was like a soft foam version. So we could do camera tests and things um, and get the idea of how the head moved in the space of the frame. Um, and and the big thing that I worked on with him was to ha- how to position his posture and his arms and legs so that we could disguise the human proportions of the of the man inside the suit so you wanted him to move in a certain way that was a little more um you know almost uh, insect like at certain times there's a sequence where he's on the hood of the car and and i think that one is one of the more effective ones and sometimes i'll watch and i'll i'll see the the human proportions and i'll catch it and i'll go ah, that's not as good um so it was a lot of trial and error in not only framing you know to show some of the windigo not all of the windigo but also in in his movements to make sure that we were doing our best to hide the the man in the suit so you didn't know you weren't aware of like oh i'm watching a guy in a suit yeah that was actually the scene i was thinking about the 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 one on the car because it's so effective um and it's it's kind of the payoff of of waiting to actually kind of see the windigo in yeah you know and and it definitely it definitely does not disappoint (laughs) Um, it's shot well and it's just so well acted as well. Um, the, uh, the cast is, is a great cast that you assembled. Um, when I was watching it, for me, the most important role, if I was looking at it, uh, in casting would be, uh, the grandmother who's played by, uh, Casey Camp Horneck. Um, because yes. she sells and sets up this whole story of the Wendigo. Uh, did you see that as being the most important role to cast? It's incredibly pivotal, and she really, really delivers because there is an authenticity and a sincerity to her that you just buy. And the thing naturally about horror films sometimes, and I don't know if you agree, is that for the most part, a lot of horror films are really pretty silly in their setup and premise. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> definitely. And what, what makes you buy into it is the human aspect of it. If these actors are selling the 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 fear and their connection to this silly premise is so real and you go on that journey with them that's why i think performances in in horror films you know as opposed to a drama have to do double duty because they not only have to you know do the character work and the plot advancement of the normal film that a genre film doesn't, but they also have to work harder to suspend the audience's disbelief on what is essentially a very silly tale. You know, this sort of premise of the Wendigo and all this stuff. When you break it down, if it's not Casey telling you this tale, you're like, you know, it doesn't have the gravitas and you go, Oh, that's silly. You know, yeah. and so you really need actors to sell not only their connection to the Wendigo, their fear, but in in her telling of the legend, you're now set up, and you're like, okay, this is there's some real real stuff going on here. Yeah, I totally agree because if she's not selling it, you're not buying it, right? It's it's like right. if she's coming off as being hokey or just not believing it or just isn't a good actress, you're just gonna kind of sit there going, mm-hmm. all right, well, just let's just get the creature out here and call it a day. And she sells it because she's building up. It's like what my friend used to say back in the day with, with like Sons of the Lambs. At some point, you have to see Hannibal Lecter be Hannibal Lecter. And when it happens, right. it better pay off. And that to me is what with the Wendigo is, is it's the setup, right? It's the whole, it's Jaws, right? It's the shark. It's the Wendigo. Yeah. It's, you know, once you see the Wendigo, it's like, oh man. And, you know, it, it, that's the payoff. It's also the payoff too of what the consequences are going to be right because once the creature's gone now you have the consequences and Mm -hmm. if she's not if she's not showing that dread and that guilt and all of those emotions you know again right it's just it's just a b-movie you know people in you know costumes (laughs) it doesn't work yeah exactly and you know, using Silence of the Lambs is a perfect example. I mean, it, it was it's a it's a basically B movie thriller plot, elevated by incredible performances. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, your film starts off um, 
right on an action sequence. And I was wondering, does that make it easier or harder to begin a movie like that? You mean from a from a storytelling standpoint? Or yeah. Standpoint? If from a from a story, story point, yeah. I I'd like to drop into something like right in the middle at the top, and then just even if you're not sure like what's going on or where you at, you if the audience is asking a lot of questions like, wait, is this, where am I? Is this modern day? What's going on? I just know that this, this man is in peril and there's something after him. I don't know what it is. And this is creepy. And okay, this looks maybe olden times. I'm seeing this native American, the chanting and, and all this happens and you're drawn in with questions. You know, I don't like to pour a whole lot of exposition into the opening of things in in a genre movie i think you should be intrigued and questioning a little bit but but uh, drawn in by the visuals almost like you know the car wreck on the side of the freeway that you can't stop but slow down and look at yeah and so you know you're like okay what's going to happen to this dude he's clearly scared and it's like there's something afoot here and then there's you know something screaming in the in the woods like oh shit, what is that and is it going to get him and and then we wake up and you're in grandma's you know room and it's been in her head it's a, a flashback or a dream and now we meet this woman and so we're we're getting a lot of information but we're also posing a lot of questions the uh as you mentioned earlier there there are a few things going on in this film as far as themes go um you know you have embracing one's culture um how mm-hmm. to handle bullying um and uh, maybe even like for a young man trying to find his his strength, maybe. Um, yes. Was okay. there anything that immediately stood out for you when you were reading that script that you wanted to focus on? I loved the familial generational aspects of it. These three generations or multi generations of the old, you know, the par- you know the the grandmother and then the parents their mother played by Tonantzin and then the teenagers and how these different generations related to each other. Um, I liked that aspect of the, of the film. It's sort of like trying to understand, you know, a parent trying to understand what her kid is going through on a, you know, a bigger level. Cause she thinks maybe he's, you know, having trouble with a girl or drugs or something. It's, you know, something much bigger. It's the Wendigo. But still, you know, the themes are are relatable of parent to child and and then, you know, trying to sort of figure out what to do with grandma. Is she crazy? Is there dementia? What do what do we do with old people? You know, how do we take care of them? And those questions are are all posed in this movie, you know, within the you know, the tapestry of this genre film, we're still dealing with real familial um, problems. What I enjoy, too, is that a lot of it's really kind of understated, right? Like nothing is kind of in your face when you have sort of conflicts or or things that are happening. Uh, Obviously, (laughs) the action sequences and and stuff like that. But as far as like the themes go, I think a lot of it's very understated. Um, especially the sort of uh, disconnect between generations, which it's not, you know, there's nothing preachy or nothing that's kind of thrown right at you. It's just kind of like you see the disconnect. It's mentioned, but it's not overplayed. And I think that works because of your directing the script and the acting, Um, which is really, I think, what also helps this film really succeed is that it's not a bunch of like people just screaming at each other about how they don't understand each other. Um, it's just yeah. very kind of like matter of fact. And, you know, I wanted to do that. I wanted it to be under the surface and, and support the uh, stuff so that this, this sort of dysfunctional family in the beginning, you know, between the grandmother and the da- and the granddaughter, you know, who's the mom and and the teenagers are all kind of all over the place and going in different directions and by the end when they leave having been on the other side of this you know this uh mystical experience with the wendigo they're they're a tightly they're a more tightly bonded family and you know for rye ryan the the main character who comes in sort of as this cynical kind of snarky teenager i wanted to 
really make sure that his arc was solidified. And that's, you know, why I have him like mocking the dream catchers in the beginning when he arrives at the house, like, what are those things? And she's he doesn't even know what a dream catcher is. And then, you know, the final images of him sort of reverently hanging one on the house to protect the house when he leaves. So that brings him full circle as a character. I mean, even within these fun, you know, genre horror films, I, I want to take characters on a journey. And he understands the significance now of his culture and of the things that his grandmother imparted upon him. And that, that very silent moment where he just hangs the dream catcher on the house and climbs in the car, you know, should tell you all that. Um, I read that the cast wanted to stage the set. Is that true? They did. Yeah, they were they were very, very specific about, you know, when you're invoking uh, the name of the Wendigo and talking about these things, it's all fun and games because Troy's dressing up as him and stuff. But yeah. they were all very, you know, so in the mornings we would say it's set every day. Whenever the wind uh, on scenes on the days that the Wendigo was present. So who would, would who, who would who would sage the set? Uh, there were some Ojibwe um, elders from the area who wow. would come and do it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. They're the ones who are, many of them are in the opening scene. So they're, oh, okay. they're singing the song. Oh, wow. So we used them and did their drum circle and we recorded them there. And uh, then they came and I asked them to just come in and play themselves, except for the one guy who's sort of the leader of the thing. And he was a, a cast person. But all the people singing and pounding the drums in that opening scene were the local Ojibwe's. Yeah. Wow, that is fantastic. Did that yeah. just happen no, by no, we were. did that happen uh, like by happenstance or or was it something that you guys saw, sought out and, and found? No, I saw I sought that out for sure because um you know all the cast were um Native American and they're very serious about the cultural stuff and none of them were Ojibwe, but they wanted to make sure that everything was you know spot on Ojibwe. Like that song is an Ojibwe song is being sung it's been passed down through generations and uh casey especially was was very adamant about you can't just have any native americans you know it has to be ojibwe yeah. and uh i was like okay so um we really went out of our way to have the ojibwe there and the little girl's mother is ojibwe the little girl in the beginning um she's local um, and, and so we really tried to work with the, the people there to make sure we were being at least, uh, you know, somewhat culturally, um, accurate, even though we, we bastardized the, uh, you know, the Wendigo legend a little bit to fit the, the story a bit, but there, the, the essence of it is true is that, you know, in, in olden times when, um, you know, there would be a famine among the Ojibwe and they, they had a bad crop and winter would settle in, um, they would turn to cannibalism sometimes because they had no food. And so that was, they didn't want people to turn to cannibalism. So they, the, uh, the Wendigo legend was that if you ate of the flesh, the Wendigo would come for you. That was true. And so it was a way to deter, I think, you know, for people to deter cannibalism was to create this, this boogeyman that would come for you if you did such a horrendous thing as to eat, eat of the dead. Wow. Uh, so all that was a, was a true legend. You know, the stuff with grandmother and, you know, I'm cursed to live, you know, these were things that were, you know, we, we, we sort of, you know, bent the rules a little bit and, and created an addition to the legend. Wow. Well, I mean, it was, it was really well done. Um, the film I, I found was just really it was it, you, everyone did such a great job on this movie. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to just mention um, you're a graduate of USC. You are a Trojan. Yeah, you went to USC Film School. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you've 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 been directing. I don't want to say you've been directing a long time, but you've 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 been directing a long time. <laughs> been directing a long time. I'm old now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we all, we all are at this stage, right? <laughs> we're all vets, veterans, or we're seasoned, however you want to, however they want to sprinkle us. Right. Um, right. but I mean, you've done different types. I mean, you've done movies for, you know, break and, um, you've, you've done unsolved mysteries and you've done, uh, projects like that. Uh, animal rescue kids. I mean, you kind of been, you know, you've, you've had a lot of different, 
uh, projects that you've worked on over the years. I know I'm just mentioning just a few of your many. Um, but I mean, as a director, um, how have you seen the, the industry change from the time that you started to now as a filmmaker? Um, you know, I mean, aside from the digital revolution, you know, I think that it has become a lot more um, open. I think there's a lot more opportunities for people to make movies and create um, content, you know, as people call it today, than there were when I first started out. Because when you first started out, you you, you had to really sort of get in, you know, that you couldn't just pick up your phone and make a movie like you can today. So you had to get, you know, on the inside so that you could have a crew and the equipment and film and someone had to pay for these things. Um, so I think there is, is just so much more, um, opportunity for young people to create than there was before. I mean, when I started out, you know, what I could do was I could write scripts, you know, I couldn't go out and make a movie because that was too expensive and I couldn't just do that, um, or create YouTube contents and, and make shorts and stuff. So, you know, I, I wrote hoping to sell scripts and now I think you know, people can pick up the phone and, and make a movie and create stuff. So I think there's less people who are, you know, full rounded filmmakers who are starting out as writer directors. Um, there's people who are coming into it from different aspects. You know, they're starting on YouTube, they're starting with documentaries, they're starting anywhere and then finding their, their way into narrative features um, rather than starting with a screenplay that you're trying to get to make. I think you've given a lot of filmmakers who are listening a lot to think about with your uh, current experience um, shooting the Wendigo. But um, if you were to be speaking to filmmakers right now, um, people who are looking to be a director or a producer, um, and I know you've got a a lot of knowledge, but is there something that you would say to them that you would find that may be helpful to them to pursue their um, their goals of being a filmmaker, producer, writer? Yes, Two, a couple of things. One, make it personal. You know, find something that you know and tell that story. Always be telling good stories. Don't think about the shots. Don't think about the camera, all that stuff. You know, you can learn in half a day, as Orson Welles said when he came to do Citizen Kane. But the story and what you want to say is the most important thing. Figure out what it is you want to say and who you want to say it to. Um, What's the story you want to tell? Then figure out how you're going to get it told and how you're going to get that movie made. Secondly, never turn down a single opportunity to shoot, shoot film. If it's you know, half a day shooting interviews somewhere with someone. You can learn so much from doing that. And you're like, oh, it's not making movies, but I, I'm going to go out and shoot B-roll for a TV news station or whatever. Whatever it is, anytime someone hands you a camera and gives you an opportunity to point it in a direction and shoot something, do it. You'll learn something every time you, you pick up a camera. That's some great advice. I really, I really, that is, and everybody who's listening, pay attention to that because Gabe knows what he's talking about. Um, if anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to follow you on social media, uh, is there a place they can go? Yes. You can follow me on Instagram at, at Gabe creates. There you go. All and right. Also, I'll add that yes. Wendigo opens in theaters on March 29th. We're getting a little theatrical run here in Los Angeles at the Cine Lounge. So uh, I'm not sure if this is going to air before then, but uh, if anyone's in L.A., you can see it at Cine Lounge starting March 29th. It certainly will. They certainly will be hearing this before that. So that will be March 29th at the Cine Lounge. You heard it here, folks. Um, Gabe, thank you so much. Um, this is really fantastic. And again, um, March 29th at the Cine Lounge here in L.A. And then, uh, of course, as I mentioned at the top, uh, the Windigo is available on Amazon, Apple TV, Vudu, VOD everywhere. Check it out. Gabe, really, this is awesome. Uh, this is so much fun. Thanks for joining me here on the Graveyard Show podcast. Best of luck with everything. Thanks so much. Appreciate you having me. And, and uh, um, we'll talk again soon. Hopefully the new movie. And as I put this interview to rest, I want to again thank Gabe for joining me here on the podcast. Uh, the Windigo is available on VOD 
on uh, Amazon, Apple TV, and Vudu. And uh, as we just talked about as well, if you live in the Los Angeles area, it will be on the big screen at Cine Lounge on March 29th. So if you, uh, if you have some time, go check it out. I also uh, want to thank Gabe. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on here in the graveyard. Um, some good stuff and uh, unfortunately some not so good stuff uh, this last month. And um, Gabe has been there both for the good times and the not so good times uh, supporting us. And uh, I just want to thank him for being a, a great friend. And um, also when he had mentioned uh, his film and uh, we had talked about doing the podcast, um, it really did help me get out of my mental funk, I guess you can call it, um, getting uh, prepped for this podcast and watching the film and putting, putting the uh, questions together and just kind of getting myself back to some sort of normalcy. Um, and it, it was a, it was a bit of a, a, a slog at first and, um, it really, it, 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 as, as I was doing it, I was really kind of getting in a better space mentally. So, um, that really helped me as well. Cause to be quite honest, I really wasn't planning on doing a podcast for a long time and, uh, this just helps. So Gabe, thank you for being a great friend as well. Um, we appreciate your friendship and thank you. Now, as I begin to close down the graveyard, uh, well, as I teased, let's talk some YouTube fun, shall we? <laughs> There's some great stuff going on with YouTube. Now, if you're a content creator for YouTube and you're listening, you may already have experienced this or heard about this. But um, when I last left you in October, I was talking about, uh, I was threatening all of you out there with my newest Catacombs of Horror. Um, it is, if you're not familiar, it is a video show that I do on the Graveyard Show podcast on YouTube. And uh, I talk about movies, and it's not me on camera, it's just a bunch of video stuff and me basically doing this. Um, and uh, I put a lot of time and effort into it, and it's a lot of fun, and um, the Count Yorga videos that I've done are just huge successes on there. Uh, I didn't realize how many Yorga fans you were out there. Um, so, uh, I finally got Blackula done. It's my favorite scenes from the movie Blackula. And, uh, I went through all this stuff. The, the video came in just a little over 40 minutes and, um, well, I upload it in December, all happy, ready to go. Finally getting it out there. Can't wait to see and hear what everybody's thinking about it. And, uh, I upload it and then I get the dreaded content. <laughs> <laughs> content warning from YouTube. Now, it's not the first time I've gotten that. I've gotten that with the Count Yorga videos. I've gotten that with some stuff. But basically what they do is they say, hey, uh, you're using copyrighted material and uh, you're not going to be making any money off of this. And, and I'm not trying to make any money off of this, nor would I want to make money off of somebody else's work. Um, I do these videos for fun and um, I just like talking about movies. I'm a fan of film and um, uh, you know, I just like to talk about stuff. Um, so this time though, was very different. The YouTube AI was basically telling me, yeah, you're not getting this, like, this is not getting published no matter like as is right now. And like I said, prior, they would say you have a content warning, but they still publish it that you just can't monetize it. Fine. Now they're just like, no, it's not getting published. So they tell you where the problem is on the time code. So I'm like, all right, so I'm going through. So long story short, I uploaded this f mm, video 12 times. I I'm not even kidding, a dozen times. And this isn't over a day. This is over like a week probably because I'm like going through, you gotta find where it is, figure out what to do, you know, export the video again, upload the video to YouTube. It's a whole thing, you know, it's a pain in the ass. And um, I finally, you know, finally I'm just like, Every time I would make a change, the AI would say, oh, by the way, no, 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 no. This is now the problem. Oh, wait, now this is the problem. Now, if you've seen any of my Catacombs of Horror, now the first one uh, I left clean, but uh, at that in the Yorga video do not have any markings on it, I don't think. But um, the last bunch I've put uh, watermarks on it. I put the studio, property of the studio. 
Uh, I've done everything. I've shrunk, you know, I shrunk down the video. Um, I- I'm doing everything I can to say, hey, look, I'm not trying to make money off of your movie. <laughs> I'm just trying to put a video. Stupid. It's like it's like a teaching video, right? Like it's like a, a professor trying to talk about something and then having the textbook <laughs> being removed, and then you're just kind of like, well, all right. That doesn't make any sense. But anyway, I hope that made sense. I think it did. But anyway, um, so finally, it just got to the point where I was like, look, YouTube AI, you do what you need to do. And once you're done, then let's just publish this damn video. Thinking it's just going to be like a two minute removal or maybe a four minute removal. At this point, I didn't even care. So I let the AI do its thing and YouTube goes, here's your video that you could publish. And it was two and a half minutes. (laughs) <laughs> it eliminated 40 plus minutes of my video. And needless to say, it was not a very good day here in the graveyard. Um, I knocked over some tombstones and I pulled some bushes out of the ground. Um, so finally, I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm done with you, YouTube. And um, I published the Catacombs of Horror on other uh, video streaming sites. Um, now, if you want to see it, you can still go to YouTube. I published a video with different links that you can find it on. Um, You can also look it up online if you want, Catacombs of Horror or Graveyard Show Podcast, Blackula, uh, however you want to do the search. But um, it's out there. Now, I'm not giving up on YouTube. Um, I'm still figuring out a way of how to appease both. Now, look, I get it. They're a business. They get to set the rules and the guidelines, and I understand that. So I'm I'm not angry, per se, at YouTube that much um but you know at some point you you have to you have to give some sort of leeway right um again i'm not just taking a movie uploading it to a site and going hey look at this movie and then have millions of people watch it on there and then me making money off of that that's not what this is about this is about me doing um a a a talking about a film showing clips from it talking over most of it anyway and um It's just, you know, it's being rejected. And of course, in today's society, good luck getting a human being on the other end of anything, right? Um, If you make a phone call, you have to sit on hold for three hours. I mean, I think I sat on hold one time for eight hours to get an airline on the phone. I'm not even kidding. Um, But, you know, that's the frustrating part with YouTube. So what I'm now doing is I'm now opening up my podcast to different streaming services. And um, it's getting out there little by little. Um, I'm slowly uploading videos because I just find that sometimes this restriction is just incredibly frustrating. I do this on my free time. I do it for fun, but I'm not going to spend, you know, weeks of my time uh, putting up a stupid video um, for free, (laughs) to be quite honest. And I know that there are some YouTube content creators out there that are also dealing with this frustration and people who are making money, you know, with their videos online. Um, and they've had just stuff just being shut down completely. So I don't know what's going on. Hopefully YouTube is listening to these complaints and understanding what we're trying to say or what we are saying, and hopefully they can make uh, some corrections based off of that. So I'm not giving up on YouTube. You could certainly go and, and find the Graveyard Show podcast on YouTube. In fact, I encourage you to do that because there's more content going on there than on the podcast. Um, so uh, definitely check that out, but you can also find it on other sites as well. Um, you know where you can go. I don't need to promo all of them, and uh, there you have it. So check it out. I'd really like to know. And, oh, well, speaking of YouTube, I started doing a couple of shorts, and uh, those are uh, getting some good uh, viewing action as well. So you, the YouTube shorts are kind of fun to do. Uh, I finally decided to do one or did a couple, and uh, they're really cool. They're fun. Uh, some quick little uh, niblets. For you to uh, to enjoy, um, so there you have it. All right, um, there you go. All right, well, listen, it was great having you here. Of course, the Graveyard Show podcast available everywhere podcasts exist. As I mentioned, YouTube and other video platforms, you can find it. Uh, go check it out, and uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you again very soon. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time. Oh.